Um, I want to thank Monica and Rodrigo um, for having me come here and speak to you. Um, one correction on Monica's introduction, I'm not a veterinarian. Um, so <laughs> I just want to make that clear. Um, if you send me health questions, which I'm happy for you to do, I will probably forward you over to our vet school team um, to answer those for you. My, as Monica mentioned, my main areas of interest are really husbandry behavior and welfare of poultry. And I work with everything from a one bird uh, backyard operation to multi-million hen egg complexes. Um, and my interest is really in trying to understand how things that we do in terms of housing and management and all that sort of stuff, how that affects birds from the bird's perspective um, and how we can improve management strategies um, to make it better for everybody involved. So my job here today is to talk to you about poultry behavior, um, especially how it pertains to backyard birds. So why is behavior important? Why do we even care about it at all? Um, if you have a sort of understanding of your bird's behavior, your flock's behavior, it can really help to promote positive interactions, both between your birds, but also between yourself and your flock. Understanding behavior can help you try to decrease negative behaviors when they arise. Um, inevitably, you will have some negative behaviors arise at some point. It'll help you properly manage nuisance behavior. So we'll talk about some of those. Um, having to do Easter egg hunts every day because they don't like your nest boxes. Uh, egg eating, how many of you have experienced egg eating? A few of you. So that can be a real nuisance. Um, and then understanding behavior really helps to increase the overall experience of you as the owner of the flock. Um, a lot of people I talk to get birds because they want to produce eggs. They want to be able to produce that food product for themselves. And then they get to know their birds and they find it very exciting. And a lot of people I've talked to, especially in urban areas, have now sort of gotten rid of their TVs and they tell me whether how much of this is true, I don't know, but they tell me we spend every evening just sitting outside watching our birds. We don't even watch TV anymore. So they can be very engaging. How many of you show your birds? Hopefully most of you. So when you're at a show hall, what do you hear? Mm -hmm. Lots and lots of crowing. So this is sort of an example. I took this at um, a, a poultry show with a bunch of different birds that were crowing. And the question I usually ask audiences with this is, why do, you, why do roosters crow? Why do you think they crow? Yeah, so to let the hens know where the male is so that they can locate him if they've gone too far away. Yeah, so the other answer is tell other roosters that they are there. Um, and stay away because this is the territory that I hold. And that's absolutely true, you're both correct. So why do you think we hear so many roosters crowing all the time when you're at a show hall? Yeah, so they're in a sort of new place for them. They basically adopt their cage space as their new territory. And then they might have a couple hens. And then who's placed next to those hens? Another rooster, and it's probably a rooster that he doesn't know. And so they crow to say, here's my territory. And that neighbor crows to say, well, here's my territory. And the other neighbor crows to say, here's my territory. And so they're constantly trying to get that happening. So understanding why that rooster is crowing is really important if you want to try to manage that crowing behavior. Roosters have a really bad reputation for being very loud and noisy. Um, and they're typically um, outlawed in a lot of ordinances that allow, um, even though hens can be just as noisy. So I, I get a lot of questions about roosters crowing and weird things, weird times that roosters crow. So we typically think of roosters crowing in the morning, and it, a lot of people think it's associated with the sunrise. And it is a little bit in the fact that at that time of day, the quality of the air is such that sound can propagate much easier. And so if, if how many of you wake up in the summer especially, um, maybe 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, there's a whole bunch of songbirds singing outside your window. So that's something we call the dawn chorus. And it's exactly because they're taking advantage 
of the air quality. So it's very still and their sound can propagate very quickly and very far in that type of air quality. And so chickens take advantage of that as well. So that's why we typically hear roosters crow first thing in the morning. They're also alerting, I've survived the night. I didn't get eaten, I'm still here. Don't come and invade my territory. But if you think about it, roosters and chickens in general, we'll talk a little bit more about social structure, they'll adopt people into their social structure. I'm sure you've all experienced that in some way or another. And they're really good at telling people apart, especially I know you or I don't know you. And so if you have a stranger come into your yard, you may hear your rooster start crowing. And it's because there's a new person, a novel animal in his view, has entered and he's trying to announce this is my territory, that's my person, part of my flock, don't interfere with that. Also, if anything new in the environment happens or strange in the environment happens, it may stimulate a rooster to crow. I had somebody give me a call one time and say, every night at two o'clock in the morning, my neighbor's rooster starts crowing and it wakes us up. What can I do with my neighbor to try to fix this problem so they don't have to get rid of their rooster? And so I talked to them about what was happening and, and talked to their neighbor and it turned out that for whatever reason, another neighbor had a floodlight that was motion activated. And it was going off every morning at two o'clock and it shined right into the chicken coop. And so it disturbed the rooster and he crowed. So they took the light down as an experiment, no crowing. So understanding that disturbances can also um, affect crowing behavior and knowing those sort of environmental cues and really why they crow help solve that problem. So really having a good understanding about why the animals are doing what they're doing helps you uh, in terms of managing those behaviors. Okay, I always work some history into my talks because uh, I find it really fascinating. So you may or may not know this, um, chickens were domesticated about 10,000 years, depending on who you talk to, they might say 8,000, but still, they've been domesticated for a very, very long time. Um, red jungle fowl are their domestic ancestor, it's believed. Um, so here's a picture of some red jungle fowl. Um, and even though they've been domesticated for a really long period of time, the behavior of our modern day chickens has not changed um, in terms of the behaviors that are performed from that original ancestor. What does get changed is how easily stimulated an animal becomes um, to perform a particular behavior. So domestication, we say, can change the threshold of a behavior, but it doesn't change the types of behavior that an animal can, be, can perform. And one of the easiest examples to understand that concept is to think about tameness. So tameness is really reducing the escape behavior of an animal. So if you went into the jungles of Southeast Asia, how likely do you think it would be that you would see a red jungle fowl? Probably unlikely. <laughs> and that's because they would flee. So they leave. They can hear us before we know that they're there, and they take off. How many of you go into your backyard and can walk straight up to your chickens and pick them up? Probably everybody. And that's because through domestication, we've changed that threshold for escape behavior. So it doesn't take very much stimulation to get a jungle fowl to take off. And it takes a lot of stimulation um, to get our modern day breeds to sort of have that reaction of fear and I've got to get out of here. Um, they're much more tolerant. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. So I want to talk about um, some positive behaviors. We're going to talk about some negative and nuisance, and nuisance behaviors as well. So positive behaviors are behaviors that are either very important to the chickens or behaviors that can help improve um, social bonds between chickens. So foraging is a really important behavior for chickens. 
In the wild, jungle fowl spend up to 80 to 85 percent of their day engaged in this one behavior. Again, they have to find their own food, um, so it makes sense that they would spend a lot of time doing that behavior. But even in chickens that are provided feed, we still see them spend the majority of their day engaged in foraging behavior. And it's exactly the same. Uh, if you looked at your chicken, you looked at a red jungle fowl in the wild, the behavior looks exactly the same. We have asked chickens, um, so we have ways to ask animals, how important is this to you? And usually it's by asking them to perform a task or to do some sort of work um, to obtain either access to something or to be able to perform a particular behavior. And so with foraging, um, we can ask animals to do work in order to gain access to feed. And the way we know that that's important to them is that we also provide them simultaneously with easily accessible feed. So you have a food bowl, put feed in it. They could just walk up and eat. Right next to it, you put a food bowl where there's a lid, and we can put weight on the lid where they have to lift it up. Obviously, the more weight we put on, the harder it is for them to do it. They have to do more work. Almost invariably, they choose to do the work to access the feed. And that tells us that this seeking component of feed is really important. And it's actually a concept that happens across the animal kingdom, that when you provide animals with tasks to get, gain access to feed and freely available feed, they almost always will pick to do the task. So foraging is very important. We know that it occurs even in the absence of feed. So even if you have birds in wire cages with no food, they will still perform foraging behavior. So very important for them to engage in that behavior. Should you not allow your animals to range, providing them with some sort of foraging access is very important. So it could be that you give them access to some greens now and again. You give them some scraps that they can peck and look through and sort food items. You can give them feed in multiple forms. So you could give pellets and crumbles, mix them together, and they'll pick through. Um, give them a little extra corn, whole corn, cracked corn. They'll pick through their diet to see what they would like. Um, so that's all also foraging behavior. So they don't have to be out in a big area to be able to do that. Perching behavior. How many of you provide perches for your bird? Yeah, so perching is very important, they, especially at night. Uh, it's an anti-predator behavior. So they go up in the, in the wild, they would go up in the trees to get away from terrestrial predators. It's also something that they do socially. So you might notice that they like to clump together on the perches. In commercial facilities, we say that you have to provide at least six inches of perch space per bird. And so when you walk into a commercial uh, facility at night, you see a lot of empty perch space, and you see birds really, really crowded together. And that's because they actually want to be clumped together at night. It's part of that anti-predator behavior. If you're surrounded by a bunch of neighbors, the likelihood, if a predator were to come, that somebody else would see it while you're sleeping is much higher if you're surrounded by a lot of other individuals. So they like to be clumped together. Um, we'll talk, when we talk about aggression, We'll talk a little bit about how sometimes perching is not a good thing. Um, but providing some sort of perching is really important. Um, we generally say that you should have enough perch space for the birds to all have access, equal access to perch space. So that's where that six inches per bird comes in, even if they don't actually use it. So dust bathing. Um, Amy sort of stole my fire on this one. That's OK. I usually steal hers when I go first. Um, but I'll give you a quick quiz. What is the function of dust bathing? Yeah, so, the, so one answer is control parasites and to provide a sort of social arena. That's half right. <laughs> so we used to think it was to control parasites, that that was an important function of dust bathing behavior. But it turns out that dust bathing in and of itself actually does nothing for parasites. 
Um, and part of that work that we know is comes out of Amy and the work that she did in her lab. Um, it turns out that dust bathing really is about feather condition. So it's about removing all those excess oils, old um, stale oils from the feathers, and it helps keep the feathers in really good shape. And that in turn allows the birds to maintain their body temperature much better. So the feathers are really an insulating um, part of the body. And so they can, they can manage their body temperature, um, heat it up or cool it down with really good conditioned feathers. Um, let's see. And then I also wanted to touch on the social aspect. So if you, you may have noticed, chickens don't really touch each other very often unless it's in a sort of negative context. Most chickens don't really even like being handled um, because then they sort of get into this, uh, oh, I'm about, about to get eaten kind of thing. Um, dust bathing, though, is one of those times that chickens will actually touch each other and it's in a very positive manner. So they're not intentionally um, rubbing into each other or when we think about primates um, grooming each other, they don't do that sort of thing. But they'll go to a dust bathing spot and they'll be right up next to each other and they'll work um, the dirt or whatever substrate you have into their feathers. But dust bathing is something that we refer to as a comfort behavior, so it's a very positive kind of behavior that birds like to do. They're actually very highly motivated to perform dust bathing behavior. So again, like the feed, we've asked them, how much do you want to access certain types of environmental conditions that help you um, to dust bathe? And they'll do quite a lot of work to get access to a dust bathing area. So we know it's very important. And it's a way for them to engage in promoting social bonds. So they're touching each other, they're right next to each other. They're in sort of a very positive mental state at that point. And they're engaged in, in this right close to each other where normally they would be having a negative interaction if they were that close. So it's a really good way to enforce, uh, reinforce positive bonds in your flock. That doesn't mean that the really bossy alpha hen isn't gonna come over and peck everybody and get them to go away so that she can dust bathe. Um, that will happen occasionally. But you'll notice that they tend to do it in groups. Nesting, so nesting can be both a very positive behavior and it can also be a nuisance behavior depending on how you look at it. So here we have um, a, a jungle fowl nest. And what do you notice about it? Hidden? Is it very complex? <laughs> it does not look very comfortable, actually. I agree with you there. So it's, it's not very complex when you think about it compared to something like a songbird, uh, where they build their own nest. This hen has basically just found a little hollow under a tree. It's, base, it's hidden. That's very important. And she's decided to lay her eggs there. If you look at a picture of a backyard flock nest, what do you notice about it? It looks very open. Mm -hmm. Is it very complex? No, so it, it actually, and it's difficult to see in this picture because it is so hidden, it's just they scrape out a tiny little bowl in whatever they're in, shavings, hay, straw, and that's it. That's all they do. So very similar in structure. But one thing that we typically don't provide for them is that hidden aspect. So cover is really important for hens when they try to choose a nesting area. And you may notice that your hens kind of get this panic about them before they lay an egg, and they may go around your yard, they look into little places, um, they might squawk, and then eventually what should happen is they go into the nesting area, pick a nest box, lay their egg, and then come out. So nest searching is a behavior that happens every day she wants to lay an egg. So every time. And that's because nesting behavior is um, guided by her hormones. So it has to do with ovulation. And so she goes through this sequence of behaviors that will take her from trying to locate a nest to having that nest ready when she's actually going to lay the egg. 
And even when you provide chickens with artificial nests, so they don't have to do anything, it's all there for them, they still engage in all of these behaviors. Even laying hens that are raised in conventional cage systems, it's just a wire floor. They don't have anything else. They still engage in these types of behaviors. So it's very hormonally driven. What you want to do is to provide the birds with something that they eventually find acceptable as a nest. Because if you don't, while they're performing that nest-seeking behavior, that sort of panicked running around looking at things, they will find what they find acceptable. And then you don't know where they found. <laughs> and typically, as is the case with a lot of bird species, let's say you don't know where the nest is, you finally get a time where you can stay home, watch her, she does her nest searching behavior, you follow her, you go and after she leaves, there's the egg. And there's every other egg she's laid since she stopped laying in the nest box as well. So you think, I'll get you, and you take the eggs away. That just means now she thinks something has predated her nest, and she's going to go find somewhere else. So you're sort of in a loose-loose situation there. You don't know how long those eggs have been there, so you don't want to eat them. You want to get rid of them before they go rotten. But if you move them, she's going to pick somewhere else, and you finally just found where she was laying. So you want to try to think about this cover idea and investigate your nest box design and try to understand, is there enough cover here? Do I need to add cover? You can put curtains in front of it. Um, sometimes it's just having tall enough sides that they have the impression that there's enough cover. Sometimes you just have a hen that's never going to be satisfied with a nest box and she's just going to go out and do whatever she wants. Um, but oftentimes you can adapt your nest box area to make it more um, what she's looking for. The other thing I would recommend is to look at when you find where she's laying, look at that area. What are the attributes of that area? Is it that there is actually overhead cover? Is it that they're just really tall? And that can give you hints of ways that you can try to modify your nest box. Okay, so let's talk about negative and nuisance behaviors because these are the kinds of things that I always get asked about. Um, so here we have that hen laying where she shouldn't be laying. So in this case, it's a uh, planting structure. But you can see how much more covered that area is and why she might want to lay in that area. So we're going to talk first about aggression. Um, aggression is one of the top questions I get asked about. My hens are beating each other up. I think I have an aggression problem. What can I do? To really understand why your birds are going through a potential aggression bout, you have to understand why are they aggressive in the first place? What's the underlying cause of that behavior? And we have to think about two things when we talk about aggression. Social formation, so how do they form those social bonds? And also, we have to think about the history of domestication in chickens. So we're going to talk about each of those. So you've probably all heard about the pecking order. Um, the pecking order was actually termed from chickens. It's also something more technically known as a dominance hierarchy. So you have your flock of birds, and each pair of birds, and you'll have multiple pairs, so every bird paired with one other will have a social relationship. And the way they determine what that social relationship is, who's dominant and who's subordinate in that pair, is that they fight. And usually it happens over a series of fights. So just because you see a bird fighting and one seems to be the winner of that fight doesn't mean they're the dominant individual. So it's sort of an, an on average who wins the most. Some of that has to do with personality. So I'm sure you all know that there are just some birds that are really aggressive in nature. So they're very dominant. Um, some birds are not and they tend to be very subordinate. And that will also help place them somewhere along, along those lines. So when they fight, they usually do it with getting a peck to the back of the head. So you might see a lot of feather damage on the back of the head. You might see some injury on the back of the head. And those are um, ways to think, okay, if you think that there's an aggression problem, do I see that kind of damage? Is that actually what's going on with my flock. 
So the other um, part of aggression is history. And so I want to take us all the way back to the Roman Empire. How many of you know about chicken domestication in the Roman Empire? Not many of you. Excellent. So this is a really critical period in the domestication of poultry. So the Romans were the first civilization that we know of that actually developed agricultural breeds of chicken. So they had multiple lines of meat birds, multiple lines of egg-laying birds. And they were so specific about their chickens and how they raised them that they actually had management guidebooks that read like cookbooks. So if you wanted to, you wanted to make a particular chicken dish, they had books explaining from hatch to preparation of that dish how that particular bird had to be raised and managed. They were really serious about it. They also used birds as sacrificial animals and for augury omen reading events, which is really one of the main purposes previous to the Roman Empire that chickens were domesticated for. And there's a really famous story about this Roman general named Publius Claudius Polker, and he was part of the Carthage Wars, and he was a fairly high-ranking general. The night before a battle, he had a particular uh, omen read, and the way this omen worked is priests would have chickens in a cage, and you would open the door to the cage and offer them feed. If they came out of the cage, and ate the food, then it was a good omen. If they stayed in the cage or refused to eat the food, that was considered a bad omen. So you can imagine that probably the priest's food deprived the birds before they had these services done because they don't want to go before a high-ranking uh, military Roman official and have the omen be bad. That wouldn't be very good for them. So what happened during this omen, they opened the cage door, the birds wouldn't come out. So Publius Claudius Polker very famous, famously said, if they won't eat, let them drink. And he had them thrown overboard. And so obviously they drowned. The next day he went to war. They lost terribly. His fleet was destroyed. He somehow managed to survive and escape, was found by the Roman legions, brought back to Rome, tried for um, impiety, and was banished from the empire. So the moral of the, that story is, if your chickens tell you, don't do something, don't do it. <laughs> and then, of course, we know the Romans liked fighting things. Um, they liked fighting people. They liked fighting animals. They fought everything under the sun. They fought chickens, too. So what happened when the Roman Empire fell apart? What do you think happened to chickens? So in the written records during that time period and from there on, there's no mention in history of any of the agricultural breeds that they developed. So they seem to have just disappeared. Obviously, around the time the Roman Empire was declining, Christianity was growing worldwide. And so the use of birds for sacrificial animals and for omens went down. Those types of breeds, we don't know what happened to those either. So what's left? Fighting. So the breeds that they had developed for fighting are the breeds that survived and were put back into the domestication process. And so all of our domesticated birds today, including our commercial lines, have this sort of propensity, genetic propensity to be aggressive. And a lot of the aggression that we see in our commercial laying hens can actually be traced back to that genetic history. So some, if you think about some of the breeds we have today, uh, Kubeleas, um, game fowl, these are all breeds that we think were very similar to the breeds that came out of the Roman Empire. So compact, very muscular types of breeds, not a lot of fancy stuff hanging off that can be grabbed onto and pulled during a fight. So they have this sort of genetic underpinning that may just be the cause. You may just have a very aggressive bird if you have an aggression problem. 
So these are some of the breeds, uh, Shamo as well, that we think that we believe are breeds that would look very similar. So with that sort of understanding of aggression in these sort of two components that come together, how many of you think that all aggression in a flock is bad? Okay, so nobody raises their hand. Good. When is aggression bad? Yeah, so when it's affecting the health of your flock, if you're starting to get injury from it. Yes, if they start beating up on you as well, that's definitely a problem. <laughs> and we can talk more about that uh, if we have time. So when do you choose to intervene? If, if not all aggression is bad, and you want some of it to happen so they can work out those social bonds, when do you actually decide to intervene? Yeah, so you're, you're seeing injury occurring in your flock. There were a lot of sort of head bobs of like, well, I don't know. Uh. Um, and that's actually a really good answer as well. So it's a really tricky question to answer. When do you intervene? When is it too soon? And so you actually prolong aggression in your flock. When is it too late? How much injury do you allow to happen? And it's one of those questions that you have to sort of answer based on the knowledge of your flock. What's sort of normal behavior for your flock? What's unacceptable? Because really what you want to do is allow them to be aggressive, but try to intervene at that moment right before injury is going to occur. So if you know that you have a really aggressive hen who's just going to beat somebody down, you might want to intervene earlier than a hen that may be sort of pecking, chasing, doing that sort of thing, but not really likely to be uh, perform an injurious type of aggression. Does that make sense? So it's not a very good answer for me to give you of intervene now, um, but it's one that really you can, you can decide on if you know your birds well. And then finally, if you do have aggression, and especially if it's aggression that's not related to social structure, can you reduce that aggression? What can you do? And there are a couple different things that you can do. Remember I said that foraging behavior was really important. And so if you have birds that are being aggressive, one of the things you can try is to get them engaged in some other behavior that they can't simultaneously be aggressive. So if they're foraging, they can't be pecking at another bird. And so you can provide them with foraging opportunities. So something like give them a bale of straw. You don't have to take it apart. You don't have to shake out the flakes. They'll do all that. You just literally put a bale of straw in their area. They will pick every single piece of that straw out. They, chickens love doing that sort of thing. If you don't want the mess of that, because at the end it will be everywhere, um, or you don't really have the space for that, other things you can do, uh, we have this other picture here. You can see they don't let their birds range. Um, the way I know that is because the grass is greener on the other side of the fence. And that would not be there if they were allowed to range. So what they've done is taken some greens, leafy greens. They've tied them together and suspended them from the top of their pen. And so not only do birds like pecking greens, especially if they don't have access to green material on a, on a regular basis, but then that's going to swing back and forth and it's going to be much more difficult for them. So it's going to take them longer to destroy that. Something like that is going to get used up and destroyed much faster than an entire bale of straw. Um, so you want to be careful about how long, how long you plan to leave those in or how many times you need to actually put them in there. One caveat to reducing aggression is that sometimes you can inadvertently increase aggression. So I said chickens really, really love pulling apart straw. So if you have a very dominant individual, what do you think she's going to do to other members of the flock that come to use that? Peck them away, yes. So you could create competition. Um, if you saw that happening, the best thing to do is to place several of those so that they're far enough apart that she can't protect all of them. And then you'll notice she'll be standing by herself, not even pecking at the straw, just guarding it, while everyone else is having the time of their life at a far, a one that's far away. So same with the greens hanging from the top. You may have to put several of those in um, 
And again, just make sure they're far enough away that the dominant individuals who are guarding can't guard them simultaneously. And then I said I was going to talk about perching uh, when we got to aggression. So one note about perching. How many of you have watched your birds go to roost at night and notice that there's a lot of pecking and pushing and sometimes pushing off the perch that goes on? So good, a lot of you. So perching is also related to dominance. And so the more dominant you are, the better perch quality you get. And for chickens, that typically means high. So the higher the perch, the better quality that is, because you're getting further away from potential predation at night. Also, you'll notice that there are probably cliques of birds that gather together. And if you're not in that clique, you don't come over to that perch or you're out of there. Um, so perching and perch design can also increase aggression in birds. And that's a, that's a time when a lot of people aren't necessarily watching their birds. And it's a time where you might see uh, symptoms of aggression in your flock. So you might see some injury. You might see a lot of bare feathers on the back of the head um, or bare heads. But you don't actually see pecking. And it could be because it's occurring during this time. And you're just not there watching them when that's happening. So what we typically say is if you can keep your perches level at a level height, that will help reduce that competition for getting to the highest perch. And also, if you don't, or you have multiple perches, um, so either, like in this picture, we have multiple perches going up and down, but there's also multiple perches across the house, make sure they're at least a foot apart. So that when birds are on the perch and they go to reach to peck somebody else, they can't actually reach them to do that. And then also make sure your perches aren't right on top of each other because um, any bird on the top level, when they poop, it's just going to fall on the birds below them. So you want to try to avoid that as well. So feather loss, I said, is a clue to tell you that aggression may be happening in your flock. It's one of the first things you probably notice. But we want to talk about feather loss. And I want to ask you, how many of you think that in these photographs, um, that if you saw this on your flock, would you think aggression was a problem in your flock? Yeah, so a couple of the answers. So a lot of you were saying, no, it might not be aggression. Um, I heard breeding could be a problem. Um, I'm going to paraphrase what you said, and I it was correct, and it just went right over my head all of a sudden. Um, so it could be health issues, like we, we learned with Amy mites. So feather condition could be bad. She might be pulling feathers. Um, making a brood patch if she's broody, those types of things. So yes, the point of that question was really to say there are other causes of feather loss that can occur, and we can get more information about that. So here I have the example of breeding. So if you have a rooster, those particular patterns of feather loss could be indicative of overbreeding or a very aggressive breeder. So Probably, you're probably the best audience um, of backyard flock owners because a lot of you probably do deal with males. Um, you know that when, when they copulate, when they breed, the males grab onto the back of the head for balance, and then they oftentimes scrape feathers off the back of the hen um, with their feet. And so if you see feather loss in those areas, it's probably due to that mating behavior. If you don't have a male, then that would tell you it's probably not breeding. It's something else going on. Um, so you guys probably know this, but they actually make, um, they're called saddles. Um, and with the boom and popularity of backyard flocks, you can find all kinds of crazy patterns and stuff. They're very easy to find online now. It's not just the boring leather um, cover. But it's really designed to protect that back area from getting damaged from the male's feet. Um, and then sometimes it can be aggression. So how do you know when feather loss is actually aggression? Uh, I mentioned the back of the head is typically an area. So remember that pecking order, they peck the back of the head. So oftentimes they pull out feathers when they do that. Um, in the bottom picture, you'll notice that hen also has a lot of neck feathers that are missing. So oftentimes if they're ducking in that encounter or they're trying to get away, 
they miss the head but grab feathers um, anywhere that they can get them in that encounter and oftentimes that's the back of the neck. So if you see head feather loss along with back of the neck feather loss, that's probably aggression as well. And then the vent area. Um, so you can see at the top, that's a male and a female. The picture's a little dark. Uh, but they're both missing feathers on their vent area. So that's another common area for aggression to occur. And if you start to see injury in that area, you really want to get in there and intervene because that's an area it's, um, it bleeds very easily. And what do chickens do when they see blood? Yeah, so the nastier, pussier, bloodier something is, the more attracted to it they are. They want to peck that. Uh, and you can end up with cannibalism in your flock, although that's pretty rare for backyard flocks. So a couple other reasons um, for feather loss. So you can have something we call cage abrasion or cage wear. And I want to point out that even though it's called that, you don't have to have your birds in a cage for that to happen. So it basically just refers to mechanical wear of the feathers. So they're rubbing up against something, which we typically see in a cage. They rub up against the wire of a cage, and that breaks the feathers. But they can do it anywhere. So if you have a, if you don't keep your birds out all the time, you might notice the closer it gets to the time that you go to let them out to forage, they start pacing. So they can anticipate that timing, especially if it's on a regular basis. And they may be wearing that away as they pace. So that we would typically see on the breast area or the front of the neck. So if you see, as you can see in these pictures, that type of feather loss pattern, there's probably something in the environment that they're just rubbing against. So it's not aggression related, it's just a mechanical wearing. And then of course, molting. If you've had chickens for a while, molting is probably like, eh, they're molting. For a lot of people, the first time it happens, it's very surprising and they get really scared because all of a sudden their birds have no feathers. And they're like, what's happening? My birds are diseased, but no, this is just molting. And as you guys have probably experienced, some birds molt what we call simultaneous molting. And so they almost literally drop all of their feathers all at once. And then there are some birds that just kind of drop a few here and there and eventually replace all their feathers and you might not even notice that they're molting. The important thing I always say, if you suspect feather loss is due to molting, look for the feather regrowth. So feathers only regrow during molting. They don't continuously regrow. And so if you see any of this uh, with the waxy sheaths, that means they're in a molt. And so if you see feather loss, then you don't have to really worry too much about it. Just keep an eye on them, especially if they're a simultaneous molter and they decide to molt at the very beginning of winter. Then you may have to give them some additional heat until they get that feathers, their feather coverage back in. I have had those. Um, and so I just want to touch briefly on egg eating. Uh, so egg eating, people often ask me, like, why do they eat their eggs? Doesn't that seem like a dumb thing for an animal to do, to eat your potential offspring? And they don't really want to eat their eggs. They don't, they don't have a natural drive to eat eggs. It's a learned behavior. And typically what happens is there's a scuffle. Somehow the eggs are moved in the nest box. One accidentally breaks. Then you have this oozy liquid. And what did we say chickens like to do with oozy liquid? Pick at it. Well, it turns out if they get access to the inside of that egg, it's a very, very tasty item to them. And so they may just go to investigate out of curiosity. They get a taste of that. And eventually they can learn that if they break the egg themselves, they can get that nice tasty treat inside. And then you have an egg eater. How many of you, I don't remember, when I asked earlier, have experienced egg eating. Yeah, so it's, it's a bad problem, but it's a common problem to experience. Prevention is really the key. It is very hard to get birds to stop being egg eaters. And mostly because if you identify who that individual is that's eating eggs and remove her from the flock, she's probably still laying her own eggs. And so you can't really remove her from that stimulus to break that cycle. So it can be really hard to do. 
The problem is that once you get a bird who's a really ingrained egg eater, they will actually start to learn that eggs come from other hens, that eggs come from other hens who go into that nesting area. I just saw a hen go in that nesting area, now I'm gonna go follow her because there's going to be a tasty treat for me. And they will literally sit outside of a nest box. How many of you have seen a hen lay her egg? Yeah, what happens to the cloaca as the egg is coming out? So you see, you see a little bit of it evert. So it sort of a little bit comes out from her body as the egg is, is being deposited. And what would normally happen is once that egg's out, it retracts back, she goes on her way. Really avid egg eaters will start pecking eggs as the hen is depositing the egg out of her body. And if they hit that everted cloaca, it's a very bloody tissue. So there's lots of bleeding. Uh, similar, you think if, when we cut our lip, we get lots and lots of bleeding out of that area. Then everyone else sees blood and decides, I'm gonna go over there and see what's happening. And you can actually end up with cannibalism in your flock from that process as well. So egg eating, again, cannibalism is fairly rare in backyard, small backyard flocks. Um, so I don't want you to think, oh my God, my chickens are gonna start eating each other. That's likely not going to happen. Um, that's a very extreme case. But the potential is there. So egg eating is a really serious problem that you wanna to try to correct. There are lots of different remedies. Um, if you go on Google and look that up, um, but none of them are really successful. So some people will say, oh, this really worked in my flock. Other people try it, it doesn't work at all. One of the common things you hear of is blow out an egg and put some hot sauce in there. So when she goes to eat that egg, she'll get hot sauce instead of an egg and then not like it. In theory, that type of aversion should work. However, chickens don't have the taste receptor for the chemical that makes things hot that we do. So when they break into that, it's not actually an aversive experience. It's not hot to them the way if we ate a hot pepper, we don't, we get that sweaty, my mouth is burning reaction. They don't have that. They don't have that receptor. So that's really, it doesn't work. If we could identify a, a compound that was really gross to chickens, yes, that pot potentially could work. The idea. Um, we don't know what that compound is currently. So you can try it, it can't hurt, um, but don't expect great results. Other things people do, ping pong balls, and the idea is that they peck and 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 it never breaks, and so eventually they give up. Again, the theory behind that is correct. But, like I said before, you can't ever get rid of, necessarily get rid of the egg that she can break, and as long as she has that history and access to that egg, Pecking the ping pong ball is not going to matter because she eventually got something that she wanted, whether it's her own egg or somebody else's egg that she got access to. So there aren't really any good methods for stopping an egg eater uh, once they've learned to do this type of behavior. And they can teach each other um, to do it as well. So it can increase, the number of egg eaters in your flock can increase. So the best thing to do is identify the culprit as soon as you think that egg eating is happening. Luckily, they're messy, and they usually get egg and yolk stuck to their face or their feathers, so they're usually pretty easy to find. If you have broken eggs or missing eggs, and you, you think you have an egg eater, you can't determine who it is, there could be other causes. So other birds will eat eggs. Uh, I one time had a scrub jay that was stealing eggs out of my coop. Uh, I just happened, I thought I had an egg eater, I couldn't figure out who it was. I just happened to see this interaction where a hen went into the coop, and then I saw a scrub jay. As soon as she left, it flew in, took off with the egg. And these were banties, so they were small eggs that it could carry. Um, so partly I had a sigh of relief, I didn't have an egg eater. Partly I was really mad because how do you keep a scrub jay out of your coop when they're smaller than your chickens? You need to go into your coop. Um, so that was tricky. Uh, snakes will sometimes eat eggs. Um, we don't really live in an area where that's necessarily a problem. 
Um, raccoons, skunks, possums, if they can get access, sometimes even rats, will take eggs. Um, so if, you, if you're finding broken eggs, think of other causes as well. Don't, don't necessarily pin it on your chickens. Um, and so to conclude, um, hopefully, what you'll take away from this is that there are opportunities you can have with your flocks to increase that positive behavior. Um, if you see negative and nuisance behaviors, there are some things we can do to decrease that, especially if you can figure out the underlying issue behind those behaviors. Um, and that behavior is really important because just knowing your chickens really improves your interactions with them as well. If you can have more of these positive interactions rather than the negative nuisance ones, um, that makes your experience also much nicer uh, and improves everything for everybody. Um, and this is just an example. This is a saddle I found online, a uh, company that made one. I thought it was really cute. Um, and that's all I have for you. I'd be happy to take some questions. Yes, yeah, so the question is if feather loss can also be nutritionally related. Absolutely. Uh, sometimes when we, so when we buy feed, you, if you're not making it yourself and you're buying it commercially, we think it's a complete milled diet. Sometimes accidents happen at the mill and they leave ingredients out. Um, some individuals can just be more prone to nutritional deficiencies than others. So, you know, a lot of times you think, well, they're all eating the same food. So if this is happening to one individual, it's probably not the feed. And that's not necessarily the case. Uh, some some breeds are more like silkies are more prone to vitamin E deficiency um, than other breeds. So yeah, absolutely, that can be if you can if you sort of work through these other things, and it does they don't seem to be the cause. Um, feed is something to definitely look at. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is about socializing new birds into your flock. Um, a couple tips I can give you. Um, Lots of people do it at night, and it seems to be fairly successful. So put your new birds into your coop after everybody's gone to bed. Um, and it seems to be that they wake up in the morning, and I, I don't know the, the why of this, but they wake up in the morning and they're just sort of like, new members, okay. Um, and, they and, and I hear this again and again. Um, again, it's sort of hearsay, but it seems to work. Um, and there seems to be fairly low aggression that happens at those points. Um, if you know your flock and you know you have individuals that are really aggressive during socialization periods, and it's not always the dominant individual, oftentimes it's the most subordinate individual that's the most aggressive. Finally, they have somebody else that they can beat up uh, and they take advantage of that. Um, you might want to consider separating them physically, but allowing them to have visual access where they can interact. So something like a chicken wire fence where they can't really get at each other, but they can have some physical interactions. And oftentimes they'll work out the most um, aggressive behavior at that point while it's sort of protected. And then once you think it's safe, um, they're not really having a lot of high uh, energy fighting at the fence line. You can remove that fence line and see how they go. You may have to put it back up. Um, but I always recommend if you're introducing new birds to do it while you're there um, so that if aggression does escalate too far, you're there to intervene and remove. Um, introducing new birds to a flock is a really tricky, it's one of the most dangerous times uh, because you can get a lot of high level aggression during that period. Typically, it should only last 24 to 48 hours and then they should have their issues worked out and their rank within that social structure. Um, but sometimes, especially if you introduce a large number of new individuals, it can collapse the existing social structure, and then you get a real increase in aggression because now everybody's trying to work it all out again. Um, but along with that, if you're introducing a small group of birds, sometimes that's better than one-on-one -on -one introduction. Uh, because then, then they, t they tend to sort of stay in their own groups and eventually come together over a period of time. And when that happens, there's typically very low aggression. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the question is about silkies um, and their lack of interest in necessarily going up, <laughs> uh, particularly for perching. Um, and of course you have silkies. Silkies, um, everybody wants them because they're so weird and interesting, um, but they're really weird. They're a really weird breed. They are a very special breed of chicken. Um, I, I have also had silkies uh, and I love them, but they were different. Um, partly it's because they don't get a lot of um, lift from their wings because of the feather mutation. Um, even though they, they do tend to have more fully formed primaries um, than the rest of their feathers, they, they, they tend not to be able to get the same kind of lift to, to be able to get up onto perches. Um, the silkies that I had also did not perch. Um, they sat on the floor. Um, so you could try ramps for them if they'll, they may walk up the ramp. Oftentimes once chickens develop a, they almost get like a loyalty to perching. Um, so it may be that whatever you do at this point, they're just like, whatever we like sitting here. Um, you, you can also try physically, um, putting them where you want them to go. That can take anywhere from a week to much longer, um, or never, depends on the, the birds. Um, that's a good tip for young birds, if they're not perching where you want them to, once they're in for the night, to physically put them where you want. Usually within a week, they'll start doing that. It's just sort of a learning process for them. Um, but silkies, at least in my experience, don't really perch that much. Um, and I had, I had mine in a mixed flock of other breeds, and they all went up. They were all raised, hatched at the same time, raised together. The other ones went up, they sat at the bottom. Um, so that just may be them, what they're doing. Um, anything you can do to make it easier so that they don't have to use their wings to get up onto perches. Um, they may feel a little bit unsafe also because they don't have that sort of lift. So if they fall, they don't have that cushion of slowing themselves down before they get. So it might be sort of a, they don't really like being up high. So you could try putting in um, a low perch. Um, and and it, if your coop design allows for it, you could actually do a training where you could maybe put in a very, very low perch close to the floor, get them to start using that, and then just gradually raise it up. Um, and you may get to a point where they stop using it again, and that will sort of tell you, okay, if I go above this height, they're not gonna use it, but if I'm below that, they may. Yeah, and sometimes chickens just don't read the books about their behavior, and whatever you do, they're just, they, they don't, they do their own thing. You, and you had a question. Yeah, so the question is about male aggression towards you. So that's a very common problem. Um, that I get asked about a lot as well. So roosters will adopt you into their flock or not. Um, if you're lucky enough to be adopted in, oftentimes they're very respectful. Um, they may not really like you because you're sort of intruding. You don't live with them and you kind of intrude every once in a while, so they're kind of like, I don't really like you. But they're respectful of you. If you're not part of their flock, you're an intruder and you have to be sent away. So that's probably the case that you have. So in those scenarios, you have to think, think like a chicken. So he wants you to go. So he's attacking you. That's his signal. Get out of here. I don't want you here. What do we typically do in response to a rooster that's flying at us in a very aggressive manner? Yes, exactly. So, so you sort of kick back because we go into, we don't really think logically at that point because we're like, um, under attack. So you just have this inf reflexive response of you either put your foot out, you kick back at them. You might, if it happens a lot, you have a broom and you swat them away. You put your hands up if they're flying at you at this level, push them away. Um, that's very natural. We don't want them connecting with us and causing injury. But, how is he perceiving that behavior? You're fighting back. You're challenging him. And so he's going to fight back even harder in those cases. So he's expecting one of two things to happen. You're going to fight back 
in which case he then needs to escalate because he's protecting his flock. Or you're going to run away, in which case he has won that encounter and has become dominant. I don't really like using that phrasing, but essentially he's become dominant to you. So he now has developed a social history with you, especially if this happens over numerous times, of I can get you to go away if I attack you. And it works, and so they attack you. So the best thing you can do is something that he has no expectation of. And this sounds really scary, uh, especially for kids, if this is happening, aggression is happening towards kids, but it works. So one, you cannot run away. You cannot back down from his aggress aggression towards you. You stand there and you, you can try to make yourself look big. What you're trying to do is reverse that social history. So you want to be the quote unquote winner in that situation. So you stand there. If he's threatening you, um, so oftentimes they'll do that sort of sidestep. You know, you know the sound when you hear it. Um, they might, rip grass or throw leaves or sticks um, a little ways away from you. That's all behavior that's preemptive of an attack. So that's threat behavior. He doesn't think that you're in his space yet, but he's warning you, don't come any closer. As soon as you see that, you stop. You just face him. You have to be committed. Um, I have been stuck facing a rooster for 45 minutes. Um, but I'm telling you this will work. Over time, it works. So that's one thing you can do. If he's actually attacking you, pick him up. Roughly, not hard, but roughly pat his back and put him back down. It sounds weird. It's scary because he's rushing at you with his feet and his spurs heading towards you. But pick him up, do that, put him down. Almost inevitably, 90% of the time, He's going to get this kind of weird look of like, what just happened? Kind of, he might do some more threatening behavior, like, I think I was attacking you, but I'm not sure. And then they kind of waddle away. Sometimes, if there's a really strong social history, they'll just come back at you. Um, again, just keep doing the same thing. Eventually, he'll realize, like, you're not challenging me, but I don't really, you're not running away either, so I don't, it just kind of confuses his reaction to you. And if you get, build up enough of those interactions over time, they may never become non-aggressive, but they typically will at least be respectful of your space. So I, I actually had a silky rooster, this big, who chased people out of my yard routinely. Um, yeah, we'll leave it at that. People were afraid to come in my backyard, um, including other members of my household. I was the only one because I did these steps as I saw his aggression building. Um, he would respect me. If I got in his space, he would attack, but I could at least go about using the backyard um, without being terrified. And, and if I went in the backyard with other people, I would act as a buffer, basically. And so he would threaten from across the yard, but he wouldn't actually launch himself at people. Um, and I laugh about that because, you know, he's just this tiny little powder puff of a chicken. Um, but if you have these bigger breeds, they can be, it can be really serious, uh, especially with kids. Yes, <laughs> they can really hurt. So try, try some of those types of steps. Um, and don't expect it to work overnight. It's gonna take time. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>